Uh, hi, I'm Mark Bromwich, uh, Merge Doc uh, here in Calgary, and we're going to chat today about doing some regional anesthesia at the forearm. So, these are blocks I do fairly regularly. Um, I find them useful uh, for fractures of the hand, specifically boxer's fractures. I find them useful for burns of the hand as well too, as well as when there's amputations of multiple digits. Um, we're going to chat about two techniques. Uh, the first is going to be an ultrasound guided technique. Uh, this is my preference. I think it makes it a little bit safer um, and it is, I think, a lot less painful for the patient. Um, but we'll also talk about um, just doing a landmark technique uh, for those of you who don't have access to an ultrasound machine. So let's walk through it here. Um, so we have our machine set up. And I'll show you how, how we uh, identify the nerve and the anatomy first. So first you're going to want to put some gel on your ultrasound probe. And the probe that we're going to use is the linear probe or the small parts probe. So the guy looks like this. The important things for us to be aware of are there's a marker on the probe on this side here. And you'll want to have that marker pointing to your left. You'll also want to check the machine and make sure that you have the dot, dot the marker, to screen left there as well too. So, once I got my machine set up, it's turned on, it's ready to go. You're going to take the forearm that you're hoping to block, and depending on the distribution that you want to anesthetize, you'll pick the appropriate nerve. Um, let's start with the radial nerve today. So, my first step would be to palpate the radial artery. Once I've identified the radial artery, put the probe on, and then with the probe, I'm just going to take a look and I'm going to identify the radial ar artery on my screen. And so what that's going to look like, it's going to be a black circular fluid filled structure and it's going to be sitting right in our near field there. If I put a little bit of pressure on it, we can see it pulsate. And then we know that the radial artery, or sorry, the radial nerve is going to be sitting just on the radial side, on the lateral side of the radial artery. What we're looking for is uh, another circular structure that's going to look a little bit like a honeycomb. It can be a little bit tricky to identify right down near the wrist, but as we move towards the middle of the forearm, that structure becomes a little bit more obvious, the nerve gets a little bit bigger. And so we can start to see it there, it's sitting right beside the artery, and I'm just going to continue to move up, proximal to the forearm, and usually by the time we get to about the proximal third of the forearm, you've got a little bit of distance between that nerve and the artery. So now we can see, uh, right in the middle of our screen, we can see the radial artery. Again, circular structure, it's black, it's fluid filled. And then just to the radial side of that, to the screen left, we can see the radial nerve. So again, it looks a bit like a honeycomb. It has that bright kind of reflective quality to it. A little bit like a honeycomb. Once we've identified the radial nerve, our next step is we're going to slide the probe medially to the middle of the forearm to try and identify the median nerve. And as we do that, if we look down at about a 45 degree angle on the screen, we can see this bright white honeycomb that is the median nerve. The median nerve is slightly bigger, so it shows up quite a bit, quite a bit brighter on the screen. And you can see there, as I move, it becomes more and less obvious. The median nerve, well, all the nerves, are quite reflective. So it's, it's really important for us to make sure that the probe is exactly perpendicular so that all that ultrasound energy is coming back to the probe. If we get off of perpendicular just a little bit, then the nerve can almost completely disappear. So if you're not clearly seeing the nerve or you're not sure that what you're seeing is the nerve, just do a little bit of a sweep back and forth and try and get that probe perpendicular. So from there, the last nerve that we're going to identify is going to be the ulnar nerve. And so again, the ulnar, the process for identifying the ulnar nerve is much the same as identifying the radial nerve. So again, we want this probe marker to be sitting to my left. And then we want to confirm again that on the screen, the probe marker is to the screen left. I'm going to palpate the ulnar artery. Once I've done that, I'm going to put the probe on and identify the ulnar artery on the screen. So again, circular black, it's fluid filled, and we can see it's pulsing there when I put a little bit of pressure onto it. Now, we're going to be looking on the ulnar side of the ulnar artery, 
to, uh, to identify the ulnar nerve. We're looking for the same type of structure, so we expect it to be bright, we expect it to look a bit like a honeycomb, and it should become more obvious as we move proximally up the forearm. And so they're coming onto our screen, we can see it. Bright white honeycomb. And then again, as we get to about the proximal third of the forearm, we'll start to get a little bit of separation there. And then from there, we can do our ultrasound guided nerve block. What we need to perform this technique is essentially the same things you need to perform any nerve block. So you're going to need your syringe, you're going to need the needle. Now you can use whatever needle you choose. I, I will typically use the 27 long needle. Um, it's relatively small and so it's, it's not very painful for the patient. There are also echogenic needles that you can get that show up a little bit better in ultrasound, but those aren't critical. You'll need something to clean the site and then you'll need to use whatever you want to block. So today I just have uh, some lidocaine, 1%, uh, but you can use 2%, you can use with epi, um, or if you need a longer block, which most often we will, because these are typically done for painful uh, conditions, uh, something like bupivacaine. This is a procedure that can be done either sterile or clean. It does not need to be a sterile procedure, and most of the time we do this just with clean technique. Um, it's also reasonable if you choose to do some sort of a hybrid between the two. Um, using the ultrasound probe, um, I think it's very reasonable to try and keep that as sterile as we can. Um, so for that, we have a few different options. There's some hot towels just to keep underneath the patient and to sterilize the site. Um, and then from there, we have three options. Um, this is the standard um, industry product that if you have available, it works really, really well. Um, it's just a transducer cover. Um, that I'll show you how we can put on, and it comes with it some sterile ultrasound gel to, to make life easy. Um, if you don't have this, and depending on which site I'm working on at, uh, I don't always have it available to me here in the city either. Um, another option is you can just use a sterile glove. Um, so typically I'll use a bigger glove, something like an eight, an eight and a half, um, and then just sheath the probe, probe inside the sterile glove, and then that'll act as a sterile cover. The final option is you can use a tegaderm to cover the probe. Um, I think this works reasonably well. Um, it doesn't give you quite as much coverage, and so if you're stuck, I would probably prefer the glove. This is our, our sterile option. So when we open the package, inside we have the following. So we have two elastics. We have our sterile ultrasound gel, and then we have the sterile probe sheet. It's important that there's no air trapped inside between the probe and the cover, so we need to put a little bit of gel inside the sheath. So open up the gel pack, squeeze a little bit of the gel inside, and then now we're ready to go. What you'll need is you'll need a colleague to pass you the probe, like so, and then from there now I've got the probe, I'm holding it, um, and everything is sterile from my end. Pull the sheath over, and then again pass that to a colleague who's able to help you out. So now here we want to again make sure that no air bubbles get trapped between the probe and the sheath. And so we'll pull it tight and then just wrap an elastic band over the top. You have a second one in case you lose one, or if you want to put one a little bit farther down, that's fine too. Now for our procedure, you still have some sterile gel. You can clean the area and go from there. If you don't have the sterile probe sheath, then you can just use a, a sterile glove and that'll, that'll do exactly the same thing for you. So because we don't have the sterile gel in with our glove packs, you'll need a colleague to put some non-sterile gel on the outside of the probe, which I've done here. Stretch the glove here and you, you want to put the probe over where the palm is. From there we're just going to slide over top, pull everything tight, and then now we have our probe surface again with the gel, so making sure there's no air in between the cover and the probe itself. And this we can use to do our procedure. Final option is to use a sterile tegaderm, and then you just put this tegaderm over the probe the same way you put it on to as a dressing. And then now you've got a sterile surface there, and that can come in contact with the patient again, no air bubbles. Again, sterile technique, so we're going to clean the area and 
go over it at least three times using chlorhexidine or betadine. And often the solution that I use for, for cleaning gives me enough of a window that I don't actually need to use any ultrasound gel. I have the sterile ultrasound gel here if I need it, but often you can get a good enough picture that, that you can see everything you need to see. So now that everything's cleaned up, we'll go back to that same process. So I'm going to palpate the radial artery. Once I've identified the radial artery, I'm going to find it on my screen. Once I found it on my screen, I slide up approximately until it's a little bit bigger. And that radial artery is just a little bit more obvious and it moves a little bit away from the radial nerve. There we go. Beautiful. So now that we found the nerve, we found the artery, we know where we want to anesthetize, we know what we want to avoid. I'm going to be putting my needle in right in beside the probe. A little bit of poke here. Sorry, sir. And then as I advance the needle, we'll start to see it coming in on the screen left there. You can see it's moving down towards the nerve. Just going to inject a little bit of a bleb there. get just below the fascia and then we start to inject a little bit deeper inject again and as we're injecting that fluid is going to start to dissect the tissue planes and start to going to fill the area around that neurovascular bundle and we'll start to get some freeze So if you lose your needle, just come back and move the probe, leave the needle where it is. And just slide the probe up onto the needle. So there, you see it again. And then we inject again. We're able to fill up that whole area. So now there's the nerve that we can see right in the middle of the screen. We want to try bathe the nerve, getting it on all sides. There we go. So now the needle can come out, and then usually the anesthetic effect will start to kick in in about five, maybe 10 minutes. Now we're gonna talk about the traditional technique or the landmark technique uh, to do the median, radial, and ulnar nerve blocks. Starting with the median nerve, we know the median nerve is gonna run in between the pulmonaris longus tenum and the flexor carpi radialis. So we have them drawn out here, but your patients probably won't be quite as well marked before you start the procedure. So if you get them to just flex the wrist a little bit, and if you wanna provide a little bit of resistance too, you can bring out those tendons, and that makes it quite obvious. The flexor carpi radialis is going to be just to the radial side, and the pulmonaris longus is going to run right up the middle. There are a subset of patients who don't have the pulmonaris longus. If they don't have that, then just go over about a centimeter towards the midline. So to landmark the median nerve, we're just going to go in between the pulmonaris longus and the flexor carpi radialis. So you want to go just to the radial side of the pulmonaris longus. The median nerve. Uh, is very superficial. Uh, it's about a centimeter deep um, and so you just need to just to go just a little ways into the skin. If you get them to flex you're going to choose your location by by going in at about the second flexor crease there. So second flexor crease in between the pulmonaris longus and the flexor carpi radialis. You, go in, you can go direct or about a 45 degree angle just beneath the surface and then inject about five cc's of freezing. That'll give you a good result. From there, we can talk about the flexor or about the radial nerve block. So from there, what we're going to do is we're going to palpate the radial artery, which for most folks is uh, is fairly straightforward. Again, we're going to identify the second flexor crease, which is where, where we're going to go in, and we're going to go just radial to the radial artery. So from there, we basically will inject, 
about two to three cc's, and that will get the, the predominant branch of the radial nerve. But we're also gonna need to fan dorsally to capture the dorsal cutaneous branch of the radial nerve. So to do that, you can either do it in the same, in the same sequence where you've identified the artery, we know we're to the radial side, to the lateral side of that, we've injected, we come out a little bit, turn our needle, and then fan out radially, and then from there we're essentially gonna do a field block. And so that field block is gonna come around dorsally, and you wanna come all the way to midline, and then just injecting as you come back, making sure you get a good dense block of the uh, dorsal cutaneous nerve branch of the radial nerve. So the final block at the wrist is the block with the ulnar nerve. So to find the ulnar nerve, we know that it's gonna be running on the ulnar side of the ulnar artery. So again, we'll palpate that ulnar artery, and then we want to identify the flexor carpi ulnaris. So again, if we get the patient to ulnar the deviate and then flex a little bit, then we can provide a little bit of resistance if it's not obvious. And then sometimes you can see this, but more often you need to actually palpate it. So if you feel in underneath, you can feel that flexor carpi ulnaris, and then that's where we're going to want to go for our block. We want to go in towards the artery, but we don't want to go so deep that we're getting into the artery itself. So we've identified the flexor car carpi ulnaris, which we've drawn for you guys here. We're going to go just to the outside of that, on the ulnar side of that. We're going to come in underneath it, advance about a centimeter, withdraw back to make sure that we're not sitting in the, in, in the vessel. Once we're happy that we're clear, we'll inject about two cc's there, and then inject as we bring back. Once we get to the skin surface, again, we need to do a field block to capture the dorsal branches of the ulnar nerve. And so to do that, we're gonna turn our needle and then we're gonna come advance all the way to midline to complete that dorsal field block. So with that, with those three, you'd have a very dense block of anything coming into the hand. The final uh, regional anesthesia or nerve block that we're gonna talk about today is the ring block. And this is probably the most common block that we'll do. There's two, two approaches that we'll talk about. The first um, is the traditional um, dorsal two poke approach, um, which we're all familiar with um, from, our, from our medical school training. And so with that, basically we'll come in on the dorsal side. Um, there's a few things we can do to minimize the pain of this procedure. Number one, if we use a small needle, so a 27 gauge is ideal. Um, if we inject slowly, that makes the procedure less painful. If we're able to provide a little bit of distraction to the patient, so even just some, some, some movement to the skin, um, around the area before you inject, um, that'll make the procedure a little bit less painful as well too. So doing those things, we're gonna come down right at the base of the digit. You can either do two pokes, so break the skin here, come down laterally, you wanna go approximately two thirds of the way um, down the uh, proximal phalanx, and then anesthetize on that side, come across, do the same thing on the other side. Um, doing both of those pokes, um, you should get a very good, uh, good anesthetic uh, of, of the digit. The second approach um, is called the volar approach. Um, and with this approach, um, it only needs a single poke, uh, and you can come in right at the metacar uh, metacarpal head, um, and basically you're going just proximal to that flexor crease of the uh, MCP joint. You're just going to go in about a centimeter um, just before you hit the bone uh, and then inject about two or three cc's there. Once you've injected, you can just massage it in and then within about a minute or two, you'll have a very good 